On our morning show from WRCO, WRCE, we love to talk about accomplishments in the community. And uh, we have one of those subjects today. Uh, we are pleased to welcome Coach Gary Schwartz from Richland Center here today, now in his 50th year. I, I can't believe that. Uh, my mind goes back to when I first started, and uh, I was just a rookie. You were, you were a veteran coach at that point, Coach. <laughs> well, I'm not sure what a veteran is. <laughs> I was experienced, I'll put it that way. Experienced, Coach, yes. Well, welcome to the studios. And uh, uh, was there any question, uh, you know, in the last few years? Uh, were you kind of shooting for 50 years, or was that a goal? Uh, it wasn't necessarily a goal, and I planning and all health and everything considered be back again next year um when coach troxel came to richland center um prior to taking the job my wife and i met with him and sitting in our living room and he talked about you know how long are you going to stay and how long are you going to coach and i said well i don't know and he said well could you make it to 50? And Michelle, my wife, said, uh, sure, he can make it to 50. <laughs> uh, and I had I never really thought about that. It just, it's been just one long, continuous journey. Um, and I've enjoyed every minute of it. I have been blessed, really, because of the opportunity to coach and work with young people and work in the community. And it gets me going into every morning. So you're on to probably grandchildren by now, right, of, of people that you coached back in the day? <laughs> That's correct. I had more trouble, actually, when kids would say, you used to coach my dad. Uh -huh. um, I got through that okay, and now I have a few come used to coach my grandpa, and that's okay. Yeah, it, it was easier to handle that than you used to coach my dad. Sure. How how many can say that? That's uh, that's amazing. So, uh, coach, you're going back to uh, your early years. You grew up in Darlington, is that correct? I grew up in Darlington, where football was kind of king. I went to a one room school. I remember getting out of school at noon on Friday, uh, so. School shut down so the kids could go to the football game. And my dad was a, a spotter, um, worked in the tower, and we would be there like, as early as I can remember, sitting in the stands watching the Redbirds. Um, and they just played this last week on Friday at B, 2 o'clock. They went, B, they had Darling, kind of a. They, B. Platteville. B. Platteville, yeah. They had a throwback <laughs> game, to, you know, too. But mm -hmm. yeah, we used to go down there once in a while um, to play as opposition, and the whole town does shut down on Fridays, doesn't yes. it? Yes. And they, well, I think they have lights now. I know they have lights, but at that time, it was afternoon game, and the town practically shut down. Bleachers would be full. Um, my. My goal was to play for the Redbirds, um, but an injury when I was in eighth grade playing baseball, I messed up my knee pretty badly, and uh, doctor said I couldn't have any contact sports until I was done growing. Unfor unfortunately, I wasn't done growing until I was a senior, <laughs> so I didn't get to play, um, and I felt kind of devastated about that. I was sitting in geometry class um, drawing football plays instead of doing geometry, and I felt the sense that there was somebody behind me. It turned out to be the teacher who was also the head football coach, Jack Bertolini, and he tapped me on the shoulder and put, reached down, and he said, you're not blocking the linebacker. And, and then he said, see me after class. And um, I was kind of nervous about seeing him after class, but he asked me if I'd be a manager, and I was in 10th grade, That and my parents agreed, and it started out in 10th grade. I was pretty much an equipment manager, setting up, taking care of equipment, fixing things and setting up drills and all the stuff managers do. In 11th grade, um, they had me go to a clinic, I believe it was in Monroe, it was a trainer's clinic, and I learned how to do taping and some basic first aid things, and they kind of expanded my responsibilities. And then in 12th grade, they asked me if I would be interested in helping the scout team. And I, there was another coach, Gary Ringen, and I would get the plays, he'd bring them to me on Monday. And he and I would teach the plays to the rowdy Redbirds, the kids that didn't play much, but they were the scout team. And I was the quarterback. I wore a red shirt to, so no one would tackle me, but 
unfortunately, the red shirt. Some were colorblind, I think. <laughs> um, and whoops, <laughs> yeah, mom didn't know about that. But it was just great fun. And although I enjoyed the playing part of it, I enjoyed really helping kids, teammates, learn the plays and the the strategy and the whole thing of football. And I learned what the other teams are doing instead of. Um, oh, back in the 60s, football was pretty basic in Darlington. Basically, the quarterback got the ball from a big guy and gave it to another big guy and then got out of the road. But it was really interesting to see how other coaches and other teams went about the game of football. So that's how I got started. I never played a, a down in the high school football or college. Uh, don't, don't you feel, I, and I've noticed that over the years, sometimes uh, the greatest players aren't the greatest coaches. Sometimes it's those that sat the bench or studied the game a little bit more. Oh, I think that's definitely true. Uh, I think that I became a student of football right. when I was a senior in high school. And watched the other coaches coach and we had some very good coaches at Darlington and I kind of watched how they went about things and how they show things and I really understood already at that time the importance of the fundamentals of football and how important it was to make sure we could do those things right and basically it was in our case it was just either hand the ball off run with the ball or pass the ball and catch the ball so that's I was just worked with offense. Um, but that's always stuck with me of teaching of fundamentals first and make it in the fun part of fundamentals. You went to college at Platteville. Did you uh, help any with the football program there? No, I worked at the university farm to get myself through school. Um, and I didn't have time for much of anything except school and work. Uh-huh. Um, put yourself through school then. Yes, so. I milked a lot of cows. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what hard work is all about. Uh, Tell me about when you, you came to Richland Center um, to apply for the job. Well, I was close to graduating from University of Platteville, um, six credits, when I got the magic lottery number of the draft. So I enlisted and took three years to uh, in, the, in the Army and came back to Platteville to finish up. And by then I kind of had a little change of career. I wanted to go into guidance and counseling because of my experiences in the military. And was told about a job in Richland Center. The, the, the professor said it, uh, a new guy up there. He said, he's a little guy, but he's really enthusiastic about this new middle school they're starting. He said, I think you'd really like it up there. I'd never been at Richland Center. Um, I'd roomed with John Turgeson who, uh, and worked with him, but uh, didn't really know much about Richland Center. That was an education, though. It truly was. <laughs> <laughs> Great person. Yeah. Hard-working person. Um, came up here. And I was told by the professor when I came up for the interview that, uh, no, this is your first job, so don't let them talk you into any extra extracurriculars. I just hit it off with Dave Siefkes. It was, just, uh, it was a wonderful interview, and he was so enthusiastic about uh, the middle school and the middle school movement, and he needed a reading teacher, he needed an English teacher, and... Uh, both jobs were available, and he, at the end of the interview, he said, uh, you know, i definitely like to hire you. Are you interested? And I was. I just, we just hit it off. And then he concluded the interview with, um, and Mr. Schwartz, you will coach football. And I said, I don't think so. And he looked at me, and Mr. Schwartz, you will coach football, right? And I think I said the second time, I'd really rather not. And then a little sterner voice, he said, Mr. Schwartz, you will coach football. <laughs> and ding, ding, ding. I, yes, sure, I'll, I'll coach football. And then he followed it up with, and you will coach track too, right? And I said, well, I don't know that much about track. And he said, well, I just need a football track coach for two or three years. Will you at least take two or three? Like, sure, why not? Well, it's 50 years later, and I'm still going at it. <laughs> so you were a Raiders coach there for a while. So Do you remember some of those first teams? Um, I remember a lot of the teams. Uh, it, it was just, it was a whirlwind. And 
the middle school was just starting. There was a lot of enthusiasm, a lot of um, staff encouraging kids to get involved in, ex- in extracurriculars. Football was a new thing for them in seventh grade. There wasn't a youth program, so we'd have a lot of kids that would come out and play football for the first time. And it just kept growing. I don't know just exactly how it happened, but in a relatively short time, we just had this culture about you're going to play football when you get to the middle school. Or I would see kids in fifth and sixth grade and they talk about when I get to middle school, I'm going to play football. And it was fun. Uh, had I know one year we had 44 eighth graders alone, which was a challenge to get them all into a game. But the enthusiasm was great. And I had a some great assistant coaches. Uh, I've always felt very supported by the administration and the parents and the community in football. But most of all, of having a family that has to sacrifice a lot. Mm -hmm. And those first few years, I kind of lived (laughs) with football. And and, then I would go on. I started a forensics program when I was my first year. And so I basically taught or coached year round but um as far as any single teams they were they were all great teams they, they really were uh, the one that's memorable is the one i coached in seventh grade and then i moved on to eighth grade and became the head coach and i had them for two years and they went undefeated for two years um they just were really dedicated group of kids but it was kind of a culture that developed of how the kids wanted to play football and just work really hard to be a raider and raiders played hard my philosophy was to play hard play smart and have fun and don't worry about winning Uh, winning will take care of itself as long as you're playing smart and playing hard and you're enjoying it that was a great feeder program for Richland Center's Hornets then because they went on a good run of uh, some really good teams during those years too, didn't they? When Coach Rip came to the middle school, or came here, Richland Center, I met with him and I asked, you know, what can I do to help you? Because I um, had worked a little bit with the high school program, mostly doing stats and things like that and helping um, on the periphery. And he said, I want you to understand what we're doing in the wing tee in, at the high school level. And then he's, I want you to have, send me good numbers, send me a quarterback that can step right in and play, and have them have fun and understand the fundamentals. And that was it. Uh, it wasn't any you know, great pep talk kind of thing. He just knew the importance of numbers and the kids enjoying the sport and being enthusiastic to keep going on to the next level and playing. And then he got me more involved of working preseason and working up with the program at the high school and did a lot of scouting in the days when you got in your car and drove off to scout. Mm-hmm. It's so much easier now. Good, good old days with a notebook or then later a VCR camera too. Did you ever take one I of those? I never or? did a VCR, um, handheld cassette and a clip, oh. clipboard. Sure. Um, that was pretty much it. Um, and we'd come back. Sometimes three, four, five pages of notes. Um, the sad thing is you can't get a team to replay it down and when you've seen something, you're not sure what it was. Where now with all the media we have and huddle, we can just play it back in slow motion if we want to. <laughs> right. Yeah, the game the game has changed, that's for sure. Uh, you had a lot of great assistants over the years. Do you, do you remember some of the names there, the guys well, you worked with? I jotted down some notes simply because I didn't want to leave anyone out. And I had over 25 assistant coaches and parent volunteers. And I don't remember all the parent volunteers um, because there were so many. But as far as assistant coaches, and you'll recognize some of these names because they've put, they're they still coaching or have been. Um, Andy Spees and Bob Pittman, Jerry Sims, Ken Lewis, Richard Cup. Don Maxwell, Bruce Wilson, Pat Neagle, Brian Moyer, Rick Starkey, Ken McCluskey, Rick Bauckham, Ed Teagues, Mark Jovic, Mike Harlan, Mike Cunningham, 
Gary Siftestead, Jerry Lynch, Fred Dillon, Sean Josem, Mark Storms, Mike Davis, and Danny Makovec, who's down at River Valley right now. Head so, coaching now. Yeah. Um, and I just had, again, so much support from assistant coaches and just great relationships and enjoyed that part of it also. Yeah, well, it's been fun for you all these years or you wouldn't have stuck around this long, right? <laughs> Michelle said that football kind of feeds my soul, and she can tell when the season's getting closer. And honestly, two seasons exist, and one is football and the other's getting ready for the next football season. <laughs> and the Hornets had a nice win the other night, too. We did. Um, we went up to Toma and got behind on the first play of the game, 7 to nothing, and characteristic of a really solid bonded team is they played together and never gave in or gave up just kept battling back and battling back and battling back and at the end we won 14 13 and really proud of the kids they have worked incredibly hard in the weight room and came to practice first practice this year in camp ready to go and it's just there's some really good chemistry there and great potential well, when you win that opener, that's a that's really a, a plus, isn't it? We haven't done that for a while. <laughs> yeah, right. And then you're up practicing at 5 this morning, too, to beat the heat. Well, we started practice at quarter after 6. Okay. Um, you were up at 5. I was up at 5. <laughs> I think probably all the coaches were. And it was kind of interesting because the fog was pretty bad this morning. Yeah. Um, it's almost like breathing water. So. <laughs> We practiced in the morning to get away from the heat of the afternoon, but we sure didn't get away from the humidity. No doubt. We'll have more from Coach Gary Schwartz coming up when the morning show continues here on WRCO. Celebrating 50 years in coaching this season, uh, Coach Gary Schwartz, our guest on uh, The Morning Show, some community conversation. Uh, we talk uh, Hornet football history, and we have to talk a little bit about working with Coach Avitus Rip. And uh, those were some memorable years, weren't they? They were. Uh, it was an exciting time for a lot of reasons. I think one of them was the fact that we were building momentum as a program, and there was a lot of enthusiasm. Coach Rip and equally important Coach Harris um, were a great team. Coach Rip was a personality unto himself. Uh, he could yell and scream and then give a kid a hug, and every there was no doubt how much he cared, as did Coach Harris. Um, I learned some things about myself and about him. One of the fundamentals of coaching some people try to, as coaches, I think, take on a persona that's not theirs. And I can remember I was coaching at the middle school yet at that point, and we weren't doing real well at halftime. And I decided to do one of the coach rip impersonations of, okay, guys, and I tried to raise my voice and yell and try to. And one of the players turned to me and he said, uh, Coach Schwartz, it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> and I started laughing. Uh, and I think that was one of the things that I've really learned as a coach is that you've got to be your own persona. You can't be someone else. And if you're not authentic, the kids recognize it. But I remember many fun and interesting things with coaching with Coach Rip and Coach Harris. And one of them was at Prairie du Chien, when we played there, my job was for three years, I believe, was to try to keep Coach Harris off the field so he didn't get a penalty. And I, I literally would hang on to his belt, and he drug me around as if I were water skiing. And he and Coach Bebo, I believe, had a challenge of who could get farthest out on the field without getting a penalty. And sometimes we'd be out past the numbers, and I'd be yelling at him, Coach, Coach, you got to get back, get back. And then finally he turned me, oh, yeah, Schwartz, oh, yeah, oh, yeah. And then we'd go back, and next time we had the ball, we'd be right back out there doing it again. <laughs> it, it was a real fun time. Yeah, that's awesome. I, I remember broadcasting a lot of those years, and we used to make jokes about you wearing shorts, too, because it'd be like November, and Coach Schwartz still had the shorts on. Oh, you would bring that up. <laughs> that was, for some reason... I, that became a tradition, and 
I received a phone call, even though the shorts were pretty well worn out and the elastic had to be repaired. I received phone calls on Thursdays reminding me from fans and people I knew in the community, you are going to wear your shorts. <laughs> and when we were in the playoffs and made our big playoff run, I remember one game that it was sleeting while we were playing, and I was there in my shorts. I had the longest socks, I think, that were ever invented to keep from freezing to death. <laughs> but uh, Clark Pedersen actually called me and <laughs> reminded me to wear my shorts. But after that season, they retired because there wasn't much holding them up anymore. <laughs> People were superstitious, though. You got to keep them. You got to keep them on. So, could you talk a little bit about your philosophy of of coaching? Well, I think the first thing, as I mentioned, is it's got to be fun. And even Coach Clergan last night, we were talking with the boys, that we reminded them, you got to have fun. You, you know, and get enthusiastic and have fun. But I, the other, th I've learned a lot of things um, from other coaches and going to clinics and my own experiences. One of the thing is you cannot take football personally, um, especially the kids. The kids, you can take it seriously. I take it extremely seriously. But the kids don't go out there in a game and try to make you look bad. And I know that sometimes coaches that get so caught up in that part of the game that it almost becomes a personal issue. And if it does become a personal issue, coaching is not going to be enjoyable because you're never going to have a perfect season year after year after year. It's football. And that's just the, the nature of things are going to go bad. The other thing that I always try to keep in mind, and I always talk to my assistant coaches, was – it's a sport, and it should be fun, but it's got to be kept in perspective. Family, school, health, those things are important. And football comes somewhere after that. And if it becomes the most important thing in life, then the kids are not going to have as much fun. They're going to be in conflict. Kids at the middle school and even in high school don't have control over a lot of things in their life that can change their schedules. And so we have to remember that. Football can teach great life skills, but it's not the only thing in life. And I try to, I take my coaching seriously, but I don't take it personally. So if a kid has to miss practice because of an orthodontist appointment, having coached at the middle school, there were a lot of those, you have to accept it. Mm -hmm. And I think that was a good part of it. And the other thing that I've always felt, and I've told my assistant coaches, and I have heard other coaches say kind of the opposite occasionally, uh, never a coach from Richland Center, but at clinics and things, of they just want their best players, their best players. And sometimes you've got kids on the team that, you know, you don't know what to do with them. So, you know, you try to just make it the point that they decide not to play anymore. And... If you really believe in football and it's got something to offer, I don't think you do that. And I look at football and the game of any sport really as a team is a chain. And that chain is only as good as the weakest link. And that weakest link deserves just as much coaching and help and chance to grow as the strongest link. And if you're going to be successful, you've got to have all those links working together and, and give them the attention that they deserve. Well, it's easy to remember some of your top players, Coach, but I'm guessing some of your memories are from players, like you said, that maybe weren't getting much time, and all of a sudden, by the time they came through the program, just because somebody believed in them, uh, they became some pretty good players down the road. Well, that was one of the things that I really enjoyed about coaching and, and still do is watching the kids grow. And at the middle school, there was such a maturity difference that – players that you think are going to be great varsity players sometimes are overshadowed by the ones and I can relate to maturing late who all of a sudden came into their own their junior senior years and all of a sudden stepped up and physically developed mentally developed emotionally developed to the point that they were great contributors and so grateful that they stayed with the program and were able to really see themselves be successful. Yeah, you mentioned too, you know, football is just a, a blip on the radar in their life. You're you're trying to prepare young men for life, and uh, you've been pretty successful at that too. 
I heard a coach at a clinic one time say that sports don't build character. Coaches build character. And I've always felt that that was important. Uh, you're a role model and a teacher for your players, and it only lasts as long as your last act. And so you just you keep that in mind and how you handle yourself in the community as well as on the football field or in the classroom as a teacher. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's, I think, helped me a lot. You've been retired as a teacher for a few years, haven't uh, you? I don't know. <laughs> Probably about 15, I guess, something 15 like that. 15 years, yeah. Maybe more. <laughs> yeah, but you're, but you're still coaching, you know. Yes, yeah, I'm still coaching. Still teaching. And, want to teach, and, I, and I feel I still am teaching. Teaching and coaching go hand in hand. I, I think understanding as a teacher the importance of considering learning styles and coaching to the different learning styles of kids it's you can't just show them and everybody gets it sometimes you have to have them walk through it sometimes you have to explain it sometimes you have to explain why and different kids catch on differently and the result is that they all can have a chance for success Football has changed, as you mentioned, and and some will say that the kids have changed since uh, back when you started. But I think, uh, all in all, it's, it, they still are looking for the same thing in twenty twenty four in football, aren't they? I don't know that kids have changed so much. The culture that they live in has changed. Good point. Where they're so much busier now, it seems like they're just involved in so many things. Uh, parents are busier social situations have changed the media type of things have changed uh, it's technology has changed things immensely uh, I think probably for the most part for the good it makes things more efficient and easier to as a coach for sure but all of those things can become distractions And so when you can work through the distractions and get the kids to really focus on what our mission is when we're playing, I think that's probably one of the most important things that we can do as a life skill is to help them focus for that brief time we have them and develop as a team, see success, understand the importance of hard work. We also have a change in that when I was in high school, we didn't really do much weight training. Throwing bales of hay would take care of it. <laughs> but we have weight training programs that go year-round. We have nutrition programs that we've never had before. And thank heavens we have a trainer on the field to help kids and get kids back into the – people that know what they're doing mm-hmm. uh, to get the kids back into the program. And the sport has developed substantially in safety Um, and that's really become a fundamental part of coaching is coaching in a safe manner Um, we do things or we did things 45 years ago and even said things that we would never say today simply because that's not the safest or even a safe way to approach the game of football Mm -hmm. yeah yeah i mean with concussions it used to be oh you got your bell rung or whatever and that's that's certainly changed there absolutely (laughs) as it should so well we'll probably see you in the booth on friday night right we'll we'll be there um i do want to give a a quick shout out to my wife michelle Um, i am fortunate to be married to a sports psychologist honestly she's (laughs) almost an assistant coach When I come home from practice, she'll say, how was practice? And she really means it. She wants to know. And we'll talk about things. And sometimes I come home frustrated and she'll help me keep things in perspective. But she also gives a different angle to things. Uh, Gives her work as a school counselor, understands kids really well. helps me kind of keep things and look at things in a little different way sometimes when I start thinking of the X's and the O's. So I really appreciate that. And and for all of the coaches' families, um, just uh, we understand how hard you have to or how much you have to sacrifice in time and 
changed meals and changed plans and organizing things around our profession and the things we get to do what we enjoy. So, Well, thanks for doing what you do, and thanks for all your years of dedication, Gary. It's been good to know you, and we'll, we'll keep sharing the booth together. We'll keep sharing the booth <laughs> and even share an umbrella when you need it. Sometimes you've done that, too. I think that was up at Westby a few years ago. It was. I was out in the stands with no protection, so, yeah, I appreciated that as well. Do you remember the first play you drew up in math class? Do you still, still know that? <laughs> yes, actually, do I you? do. <laughs> Yeah, it was. Uh, Are we going to run it on Friday night then, or not? Uh, no, we don't run the straight tee anymore. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks for coming in, Gary. It's been a pleasure. Oh well, thank you. I, I really enjoy it. And thanks all help for WRCO too. It, You've really promoted our program great. Yep, and we'll continue to do so. So celebrating 50 years coaching and uh, and beyond, uh, Coach Gary Schwartz this morning on today's morning show.